Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon for a happy hour edition of Food for Thought. I'm Elizabeth Henderson and I am the Senior Director of Enrollment Management and Student Services in the, um, in the McCall School of Business. Um, I am so excited about the overwhelming response that we've received to relaunching this series in a virtual format. Um, we have over 520 people who have registered for this particular session, um, session including current students, um, over 200 alumni, including some from overseas, um, our Executive Leadership Institute clients, and um, com community members from all over. So thank you so much for joining us, um, and we're excited to have you here today. The McCall School of Business, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, is part of Queen's University of Charlotte um, and was founded almost over four, um, almost 40 years ago um, on three C's, competence, character, and commitment to community. Um, this has kind of driven a leadership focus for the business school for the past 40 years. And so I think it is fitting that we kick off this series with our Dennis Thompson Chair and Professor of Leadership, Will Sparks. Um, so I want to go ahead and introduce Will to you. Um, many of you know him um, and are on this session because you know him. He is um, one of our most popular professors. Looking at the people who registered, um, you were given the opportunity to say what your affiliation was with the McCall School. We had several people whose affiliation was simply that they are a fan of Will's. Um, so we know that he is a huge draw for these types of things and we're really honored to have him talk to you today about building personal resiliency in a time of uncertainty. Um, before I turn it over to him, I wanted to let you know, um, let him know he's always making fun of my beer selection. So I've got this Juicy J from <laughs> Legion Bre um, Brewery. I hope that you approve. Um, and I want to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Will. Thank you, Elizabeth. A little disappointed not to see the Bud Light there, but um, I'll take the Juicy J. Thank you all for being with us this afternoon. I really appreciate the turnout and appreciate you making some time out of your schedule to explore this concept uh, with us as we go through uh, this program today. So I want to thank you for being with us. I'm really looking forward to the time that we have for this discussion. Um, the plan is for me to take about 40 minutes or so and, and talk a bit about uh, resiliency, what we can do internally to better manage stress. And for those of you who know me, that's going to anchor on managing our unique shadow, uh, which is activated under stress. And I'm also going to talk about some external strategies that are emerging to help navigate these uncertain times. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this time together. And then we'll hold uh, roughly 10 minutes or so for Q&A after the discussion. So if you've got questions, please let us know and uh, we, will, we will certainly try to get to those. My first order of business, uh, we've got a couple of polls that we're gonna be going through this afternoon to give you an opportunity to, to interact some and let us know uh, what you're thinking or what your leadership style is. And the first poll is to ask you what beverage you are enjoying, enjoying this afternoon. So we've started that poll now. You can see there the options that you have. We already know Elizabeth is uh, number three three, I think five o'clock somewhere, enjoying her Juicy J. Uh, so take a few minutes or take a moment, if you will, and, and let us know what you're enjoying and we'll take a look at the results there in just a moment. Um, let me talk a little bit about the goals that I have for the discussion today and uh, what, I, what I would like to accomplish. Uh, the first thing I wanna do is take sort of an inward dive and look at our uh, internal responses to stress and that uh, involves exploring the relationship between self-actualization and leadership something that i've spent the better part of 20 years researching um, and specifically with regard to that i want to talk about the three unique shadows that we have based on your style and you'll have a chance to self-assess if you haven't already in just a moment and how those are uniquely triggered uh, during this time of the social distancing and the uh, stay at home uh, and the sort of total uh, shutdown of the economy and really uh, for in many ways the, the entire globe. Um, so I'll talk about what are triggering those shadows uniquely uh, in this context and how to better manage them. 
Um, and then I just want to explore some, some emerging strategies just over the last weeks or even a couple of days that have come out as something that we can all uh, participate in to help us regain a sense of control and regain uh, a sense of routine that allows us uh, to really perform at our best. And so that's, that's sort of what I have uh, in store for us today. So let me get started and just level set. I think it's important just to sort of level set that we are living in unprecedented times. I remember I was on I-77 driving up to Queens um, in, in, on September 11th, 2001, uh, going to teach uh, when uh, we were attacked. Uh, and remember uh, very vividly pulling over to the side of uh, I-77 and uh, listening uh, with horror when the second plane hit the tower. And uh, this is also being compared to the great wars of World War I and World War II uh, as far as the global impact this is having. And so I think the first thing we should realize is that th this, is, uh, this is an unprecedented event and it's causing stress in our lives and in the lives of our families and friends and loved ones and coworkers and teammates and just the community at large in ways that's really hard to imagine. I'm gonna to touch on a little bit the, the notion of this collective pandemic dreaming that's going on and how that's impacting our lives as well because it's certainly showing up in our dreams um, in addition to affecting our daily lives. Uh, so this is, this is unprecedented, um, but I'm also a, an eternal optimist and I don't even think you have to be an optimist. I think you can be a realist to know that we're going to get through this. We're going to get on the other side of it. And I believe we're going to be better for it. I think we're going to be stronger. We're going to be more resilient. I think we're going to express gratitude. We're going to, um, we're going to sort of savor. We've learned to savor things that many of us perhaps um, had let go of. And we're not going to let those go again. And so I think there's a lot of good on the other side of this. Uh, but we're in the middle of it now. So we've got to keep the faith and, and stay positive. Um, in this discussion, there are sort of two different areas or arenas for development that I want to touch on. And the, the first is internal development. This, this kind of affords a unique opportunity for growth and development. And then the external piece. And so while I think it's very important for reflection and the sort of personal growth that can come out of this situation uh, because of the solitude that um, it it's created for many of us, uh, whether you whether you want it or not. Uh, it's a unique opportunity to take advantage of that solitude. Um, there's also an opportunity for physical activity and movement that is critical to keep us um, healthy and sort of at our optimal level. And so I'm going to talk about some strategies uh, outside of the personal development arena before we move into the uh, Q&A section of today's program. So um, I want to uh, offer you uh, a chance to take a, a very short free assessment that will identify your unique style and your unique shadow. There are three styles and there are three shadows and we're going to touch on those in a moment. And there are two ways that you can uh, access this survey. The first way, and some of you have already done this as part of the sort of pre-work and I'm assuming some of you haven't. So if you haven't and you would like to, please, uh, there are two ways you can take the survey. You can um, text my name, Will Sparks, it can be all lowercase, all caps, it doesn't matter, to the number 36260 and download my free app. And from that app, there's, uh, you just add it to your uh, smartphone home screen and then you can it says ALP survey. You click on that and you can complete the survey. It's very short. Uh, take you just a, uh, a minute or two to do that and you'll immediately be taken to your results. So that's one way you can complete the assessment. The other way is you can just navigate over to www.alpfree.com. Again, www.alp, that stands for Actualized Leader Profile Free, Dot com and there at the bottom of that you'll see the purple uh, button that says click here to complete the survey. Either way will get you to the assessment and you can take a moment and complete that because that will really anchor um, a lot of our conversation that we're going to talk about today. So um, this is based on, uh, many of you know, I, uh, last year I published a, a book, Actualized Leadership, Meeting Your Shadow and Maximizing your potential. Um, it is based on 20 plus years of research uh, into human potential 
personal resiliency, leadership, self-actualization, obviously. Um, and so I've, I've tried to uh, build it on very uh, sound theory. Um, but I've also coupled that with interviews with a number of uh, highly regarded and well-respected leaders um, in, in our business world today and beyond the business world. And so some of those leaders that were um, kind enough to participate uh, in this project and in this work were Jeff Brown, JB, uh, the CEO of Ally Financial, Dr. Pamela Davies, our former president, uh, who's uh, now in uh, chair of strategy professor here in the business school and also a director at Sunoco. Uh, Fred Whitfield, the president and vice chairman of the Charlotte Hornets, a number of leaders. If I have any Episcopalians on the webinar, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, the most reverend Michael Curry uh, also participated in this. And so there are a number of leaders with unique perspectives that I think balance the theory piece with the applied aspect. And they've given great interviews and insights into practical wisdom and strategies that you can put in place to be not only a better leader, but a better person. And obviously it offers the free assessment and hopefully you've had a chance to complete that uh, leading into this now. So I wanna start with uh, this quote from Carl Jung because it really frames um, what I would like to maybe the, the key point of this. Um, and if there's not anything else that you remember from this discussion, I would just invite you to reflect on, on this. Um, the more you fear something, the more likely you are to experience it. That's not my uh, sort of uh, statement. That, is, uh, first, that first was um, articulated by Viktor Frankl, who survived the Holocaust and published the best-selling book, Man's Search for Meaning, which is a phenomenal book. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it, Man's Search for Meaning. And in that a book, Frankel um, declares that uh, there's a tragic irony of the human condition. And that is the more we fear something, the more likely we are to experience it. In other words, the more we let fear drive our behavior, we increase the likelihood or the probability that we're gonna experience the very thing that we're trying to avoid. Carl Jung, who you see here in this slide, said it a slightly different way at around the same time, but he's essentially agreeing with Frankl. He said, we meet our destiny on the road we take to avoid it. The shadow behaviors that we engage in under stress uh, are more likely to bring about the very thing we're trying to avoid. So, that's the first thing I would invite you to reflect on. Um, the, more, the more you fear something, the more likely you are to experience it. And that's why it's so important to become aware of that shadow response that we have under stress and to manage that. Because, and this is my second uh, point I would ask you to reflect on, if you don't manage your shadow, it will manage you. And it doesn't manage you to a good place, all right? It manages you to something that's less than optimal, if not outright dysfunctional. So if we have an opportunity to, to be aware of and acknowledge our shadow, to manage it, or we can deny it and project it onto others. And in doing so, we feed it and it manages us. So it's an invitation to be honest, acknowledge that darker side of ourselves and integrate it. When we acknowledge it and we begin to embrace it, we actually integrate it. And in doing that, uh, we reclaim that power and that freedom that Viktor Frankl and Carl Jung remind us that we have. So with that, I want to get into the discussion. And this is the second poll that we would like to ask, and that is, what is your style and your leadership shadow? So let's activate the second poll and see how many achievers we have, how many affirmers we have, and how many asserters we have. Achievers, affirmers, and asserters. And the first style is the achiever style. And these individuals are driven out of recognition and achievement, obviously the name is achiever. Um, individuals that are very, at their best, the actualized achievers, detailed oriented, organized, efficient, thorough, focused. They have deep technical expertise. Um, and so some, let me show you some famous uh, achievers there. You're gonna recognize uh, these folks. Michael Jordan, uh, Lady Gaga, who is very detailed oriented, a perfectionist, Oprah Winfrey, Bill Gates, uh, individuals that we know, by the way, all the pictures you're gonna see are individuals that have been 
profiled by Harvard Business Review with regard to their dominant mode of need. And again, you see the focus is on success, improvement. These individuals are recognition driven. But the shadow of an achiever is a fear of failure. And this is where I would, for this one, I'll use the example of if you don't manage your shadow, it's going to manage you. And the more you fear something, the more likely you are to experience it. So let's take a look at these shadow traits. And they're the dark side of the positive element. So you're under stress in an organizational setting, the Achilles heel of an achiever is the individual becomes a classic micromanager. And so detailed oriented becomes narrow minded, organized becomes inflexible. You can go down and across for all of these narrow minded, inflexible, rigid, obsessive, critical, uh, that classic micromanager, it has to be my way. Uh, all right, looks like the affirmers, uh, the affirmers have it. Uh, half of our folks are, 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 so there's a lot of love on this webinar. That's great. So the relationship uh, oriented affirmers, and then it looks like the asserter and the uh, achievers are fairly close with the asserters winning out as the second most important or second most prevalent. Um, and so, but you see how these light qualities go dark under stress. And that, to me, if you look at those dark qualities, that sounds like a recipe for failure, being narrow minded, having a scarcity mindset, insisting that everything has to be my way. Um, all of these things, they either will lead to outright failure or I think they're going to uh, impact, adversely impact the trajectory of what we could experience with regard to success or happiness or career tra trajectory, career development. We sort of limit that artificially if we're not willing to delegate, if we're not willing to go with the flow and be open to what life, not what we plan, but what we're given sort of thing. So it's important to recognize these shadow qualities, the fear of failure shadow, so that you can, when you feel it coming up, you can begin to manage it. I'm gonna talk about managing these aspects in just a few moments. But with specific regard to the coronavirus, to the stay at home, shelter in place, uh, social distancing, all of the, when I say the coronavirus, I'm talking about all of these dynamics that have emerged. This is what underlies the shadow trigger for the achiever. It's not necessarily that we're not gonna win or we're not gonna get the recognition that we're seeking, but it, it's a deeper level. It's the instability, it's the ambiguity, it's the lack of consistency. Um, achievers run a, run a tight ship, you know, and so, there's consistency and we have routines that we stick to. And so we have a very, you know, organized and efficient process to start our day and get through the day. And all of that has just gone out of the window like that. I mean, this change was so sudden and now we're homeschooling and we're working from home and we may be now sharing an office, uh, a house that's become a dual office space or maybe a triple office space. And so all of our patterns and all of our predictability have, gone out of the window. And we don't know when and how this will end. We don't know when the new normal is going to emerge, uh, but we're pretty sure that things are going to be different uh, for quite some time. And I don't think that's going to be an altogether bad thing. I think it actually has a very positive, uh, there's an opportunity there, but that uncertainty triggers these shadow qualities and traits for the achiever. So being aware of that, and, and when you feel that coming on, we'll get into managing the shadow of this, but I think one of the things that's critical for the achiever is to um, start to redefine perfection as the opportunity to spend this extra time with family, or maybe redefine perfection as well. Maybe some consistency has gone out of the door, but now I have some time to walk every day or read a book or write a book, whatever the case may be. So there's a way we can sort of, I think, re, redefine that as we, as we move through this, trying to deal with that lack of predictability. So um, that's the achiever. The, it looks like uh, roughly half of the folks on the webinar today are, are the affirmers, and that is the relationship-driven style in the ALP framework. And so these individuals 
are more driven out of personal connection to others. Again, the relationship piece is paramount. So the achiever feels stress if he or she doesn't win or maybe isn't recognized. The affirmer feels stress when there's the sense of conflict or a relationship could be harmed or impaired. And so if you look at the natural um, traits of the actualized affirmer on the left side, the, the light side, friendly, empathetic, loyal, sometimes to a fault, helpful, generous, all of these positive traits. I often say that affirmers make life and work worth showing up for. They're always there to listen, to encourage, to give a hug. Uh, they're just very loyal, very helpful. Um, and so they really do sort of provide the, the glue that holds us together. And I think in many ways, for those of you that may be familiar with the servant leader or servant leadership model, um, that they have a natural inclination toward putting others first and sort of carrying the burdens of the organization on their shoulders. And so they're a very important part of our organizational life. And famous affirmers, again, you're gonna know these individuals, Ellen DeGeneres, very relationship oriented, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, number of, uh, of well-known folks, even Charlie Brown, for those of you that I, I just, I know it's peanuts, but we called it Snoopy growing up. So those of you who remember Snoopy, uh, Charlie Brown always putting everyone's needs uh, above his, uh, trying to make sure everyone's happy. And so this style is really around warmth and empathy and caring for others. But look at the shadow qualities and those shadow um, triggers especially as they relate to the situation that we find ourselves in right now. So a lack of interaction, interpersonal uh, interaction. Um, for many affirmers who rely on that opportunity of uh, interacting uh, physically, there's kind of you know the hugs or the pat on the back, helping others, nurturing, taking care of others. Um, you know, this has been, or by and large, has been broken. It will come back, uh, we will get through this, but right now, that inability to, to connect um, in person, face-to-face, -face, and to help others um, is, a, is a real trigger for the shadow. Loneliness um, is a trigger as well, um, and, and so dealing with that, and we're gonna share some resources with you all after the, the webinar is over, and one of the resources um, is, a, is a blog that I published a couple of weeks ago about embracing solitude in this time, not loneliness. So reframing this uh, situation as an opportunity to grow in solitude um, as opposed to seeing it as loneliness because there's an opportunity for self-care that affirmers um, really can take advantage of. Oftentimes, affirmers put the needs of others uh, above theirs to the point where there's no time left in, in the day. And so I think for many affirmers right now, instead of seeing loneliness, see an opportunity for self-care that maybe they've neglected in the past, um, as well as some other strategies that we'll get to uh, in just a few minutes. So that's the affirmer style. And then the, the third style is driven out of a need for power, and that is the asserter style. And I, I, I should have, let me back up just a moment. Now I want to recognize these icons. For the achiever style, the icon is the, it's not just the gold trophy, it's, or the trophy, it's the gold star in the trophy, recognition driven, winning, success, personal discipline, improvement. For the affirmer, the icon is the relationship there. So you see communicating, talking, supporting each other there uh, is meant to indicate the affirmer style. But for the asserters on the webinar, and I would raise my hand, this is, my style, so I know this one probably best of the three. The icon there is, is Thor's hammer, and there's some asserters that don't like that because they think it's a bit harsh, but I'm trying in the icon to convey that image of sort of this absolute control of the weather and power, and um, I think it, I hope it gets the point across, although there's something, it's a little harsh. I'm a big Marvel Comics fan, and Thor was my favorite, so Anyway, uh, there you go. But the shadow of that asserter style is a fear of betrayal. It's a fear of vulnerability. And so if you look on the light side, the actualized asserter at your best, competent, decisive, competitive, candid, courageous, all of these positive qualities uh, that you think of sort of 
natural leadership qualities. Many asserters have um, many asserters have found themselves in leadership positions throughout their entire lives. And so, whether going all the way back to grade school or high school and college and hobbies and sports and athletics, in any number of ways, uh, they often have raised their hand because we like to be in charge. And so, asserters have often found themselves in leadership roles. And some famous asserters that you see here, uh, Barbara Walters, uh, Serena Williams, Martin Luther King Jr., Frank Sinatra, individuals that were decisive results oriented, very confident uh, with power uh, and, and, uh, and a, a need or a preference to be in control. Um, and so there are many other uh, folks, uh, Jack Welch, who recently passed away, former CEO of GE, was profiled by Harvard as having a very high need for power. And so there's a lot of good that, can, that goes with all three styles and certainly goes with the asserter, but this, uncertainty and lack of control uh, is really triggering uh, a lot of these shadow uh, qualities for the asserters out there as well. Um, so what are asserters, what do we, we like control, we like predictability, we don't like vulnerability, we don't like asking for help, we don't like not being able to help someone. And yet, here we are. We are in a situation where the cost of social distancing and the, the need to, to stay safe. Um, we are not only in a position where we may not be able to help others, uh, we, may, uh, have, we may need help ourselves and we may have to ask for help. And that's a trigger for the asserters. Feeling vulnerable, uh, you know, this is an unprecedented time in our history. And I think we ought to recognize it as such. Um, and as soon as we stop trying to paper over it and just Put a happy smile on it and say some positive affirmations. I mean, that can be helpful, but it's not going to solve this situation. And so we are in an unprecedented time and that lack of control and vulnerability are triggering these. So you see, if you look back here, how these light qualities go dark. So confidence becomes arrogance, decisive becomes impatient, competitive becomes controlling. You can go down and across for all of those. And what we have to be mindful of is not creating codependency in others. Uh, that need to be right, that need to be in charge. We like to have the last word in arguments. Um, we have to be mindful of that because uh, that creates and sort of reinforces this dependency cycle that is uh, so dysfunctional in any arena, whether it's at work or at home. And as counterintuitive as it may seem for the asserter, um, it is actually by expressing or even embracing vulnerability, that we are afforded this opportunity for, I think, transformational growth, which allows us to hold on to the light and, and better manage uh, those darker qualities. So let me talk about some specific strategies for managing the three shadows, um, and, and then I'm gonna move into some external activities before the Q&A. So let's go back to the, the first shadow, which is the fear failure for the achiever style. And I want to start with some overall strategies that apply for all three. Okay, so these are just some basic strategies or tips that to keep in mind or to jot down and, uh, and, and to be mindful of these, um, uh, irrespective of what your unique style and shadow are. The first, I think, to keep in mind, and this applies across the board, in any setting, uh, and this will apply when this is behind us and we, we've gotten on the other side of this current state of the coronavirus. But that is, uh, Buddha famously said, don't be your emotion, be the awareness behind it. Therein lies your opportunity for growth and even personal transformation. Don't be the anxiety, don't be the jealousy, don't be the fear, don't be whatever that negative emotion is. Be the awareness behind it. And now we are being tested in a way that maybe we never have before, but it affords this incredible opportunity to really be mindful of why do I feel that? What's, what's really going on here? And if we take the time to explore that, it is a very unique invitation, I think, for 
for true growth. And so they, again, remembering when you feel that emotion coming over you and it overtakes us sometimes, it's just stepping out of that and going, wait a minute, don't, don't give in to the dark side and just be the emotion, uh, understand what's going on and, and be the awareness behind it. Um, the second applies, I think, to all of them, maybe especially for the assertors, but I do think this, is, this applies to all of us. It's be mindful of what we can control in this current situation. All right, there's a lot we can't control. Uh, we can't go to the office. Uh, we can't go out to eat. For those of you here in Charlotte, we can go uh, get to go food at Selwyn Pub, but we can't sit outside at our satellite campus, uh, famously at Queens, we call it our satellite campus. We can't um, see and spend time with people like we used to and we want to. So there are a lot of things that are out of our control. But what we have to focus on and be mindful of are the things that we can control. So what can we control? You know, just little things. I mean, be, being aware of, you know, I can control how many times I wash my hands. I can make sure that I'm, I have hand sanitizer in my car. I can make sure that I have either have a mask or that I've, I've built a mask. I can control social distancing. I can make sure that I'm, if I'm out walking or walking the dogs or running or whatever or in the grocery store that I can manage that aspect. I can control technology. Zoom is free. There's a free application. You don't have to pay anything to use Zoom. Um, and so I can control technology to connect uh, with family and friends and loved ones that I'm not able to be with physically. I can control my exercise. I can control getting up and walking, or I can control projects around the house that need my attention. I can also spend this time with family um, and, and cherish this time uh, because it will be fleeting and we will get on the other side of it and we may look back and realize we had a huge opportunity to watch our children go or to spend time with our parents or spouses or significant others, loved ones, whatever that may be, and to try to relish this time, even when sometimes, you know, that frustration starts creeping up, trying to be mindful of that, stepping back and seeing it in terms of gratitude instead of frustration. Um, and, and I think the other thing we can control um, is the amount of news that we sort of watch. I mean, I, I wanna be an educated consumer. I look at the Johns Hopkins website, but um, be mindful of how much you're consuming and, and what happens to you when you're over consuming and, you know, get the news for the day, but maybe then shut it off and, and uh, focus on something else as well. So for the, for the achiever style specifically, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what, you can, what you can do. And I think that really for the achiever style, it's learning to reframe perfection. Uh, the curse of an achiever is perfection. And the reason I call it a curse is because it's impossible. Perfection, absolute perfection, at work, in our personal lives, at home, it's just not possible. And those of you that are spending a lot more time with children at home, you know, you, you understand this very clearly. So redefining, letting go of that need for everything to be perfect in my way, and really trying to reframe perfection uh, in this sense of time together, even though it may be a little sloppy or a little muddy or whatever that may be, but really uh, focusing on that. I think the other real opportunity for uh, the achiever is to develop more of a growth mindset. Instead of seeing world in terms of scarcity and the glass is half empty, really develop more of a growth mindset of what can I learn from this? What new skill can I develop? Maybe it's time I dust off the guitar or, or pick back up the piano or, or write the book or whatever it is, but really trying to reframe this instead of what I can't do, looking at it from a growth mindset perspective and, and thinking about what you now have the opportunity to do that perhaps you didn't have time before. So I think there's some real um, unique challenges for the achiever that allow us to better manage that fear, failure um, mindset and shadow. For the, uh, for the affirmer, this one hits home because of loneliness and the lack of connection to others. Uh, but I've already touched on this a bit. We have wonderful technology through FaceTime with our iPhones or through Zoom or through whatever you can do. Sometimes it's just, to be honest with you, actually, I prefer having just telephone conversations for the most part. I, for some reason, I think I, I 
just concentrate more on the actual conversation. But whatever, whatever that is for you, we have technology that allows us to sort of connect um, with others. But this is the real opportunity for the affirmer. You hear a lot today about self-care. Now's the time to attend to yourself and take care of your needs and exercise like you haven't been able to or, you know, whatever project you've had or whatever personal development goal you have that has been sort of put on the back burner because you're taking care of the needs of others. Uh, it's very likely that if you are creative and you're intentional, you can find a window of time every day where you can engage in more self-care. And it's important for the affirmer to do that without guilt. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing that you put needs of others um, so high in your priority list, but I often remind affirmers that you also need to remember on the airplane, they say, put your oxygen mask on first so that you can help uh, those beside you. And I think that's especially true in this case now. So there's an opportunity to really uh, connect to self-care without guilt, without feeling guilty. Um, and part of that connection, I really get into this uh, in the book, is to connect to your purpose. So the other connection piece is actually an internal piece of what is your purpose? And when you connect to purpose, you identify that and you begin living a life on purpose, some of these shadow qualities you see here become much easier to manage. It's much easier to embrace conflict as, as normal um, if you're doing so because you are living a life on purpose. It's much easier to make difficult decisions uh, or to say no to someone who's used to you saying yes or to be overly accommodating. It's more easy to manage those things when you've connected to your, to your purpose. And so, again, a unique opportunity, I think, for that in our lives. And then finally, for the asserter, um, this out of control and feeling vulnerable, these are real challenges um, for us. And um, I think that it's an opportunity to remind us that, you know, we really don't have that much control to begin with. I mean, they're little routines and habits we put together, but when you've been in a car wreck that wasn't your fault, you realize uh, how many things are outside of your control or when you've had the best laid plans and there's one, one threat, one thing you didn't think about and it upends the entire plan. I always, I fly a good bit, um, and every time I'm going down the runway, I start thinking about how little we are in control of things. And so this may be an opportunity to reframe this notion of control and, and be more willing to let that go. And I also mentioned um, embracing uh, vulnerability. Vulnerability, um, if anyone hasn't watched Brene Brown's TED Talk, The Power of Vulnerability, I highly, highly recommend it. It's the number one watched TED Talk of all time, and it's called The Power of Vulnerability, and Brene Brown in that TED Talk reminds us that um, the only way to have authentic connection with others uh, is to embrace vulnerability, to let our guard down and to be truly seen, and that includes our fears and insecurities um, with others. And so, yes, there's a risk we take when we do that. We may um, we may be ridiculed or we may have our heart broken, but C.S. Lewis, this is a, a rough approximation of a quote from one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, who says, the other option is to take your heart and lock it away and put it away and, and make sure that no one can uh, damage it or break it. And he says that in that coffin of security, something much worse happens. It becomes unbreakable, irredeemable. And so if you're going to live a full life, if you're going to have authentic connection to others, you have to be willing to embrace vulnerability. Um, and so I would just encourage you to think about that. Having said that, revisit those things that we can control um, and, and focus on those. I apologize. My, my, my Kapapu Shelby uh, is, has spotted another dog walking down the street. So hopefully that will end in a moment. But um, so vulnerability, embracing that, uh, and, and looking at where we can have control in our lives. Um, and then there's also a Forbes article that I'll be sending a link out to on routine and how important it is to, if you've gotten out of, you know, off your routine a little bit, I think most of us have, 
getting back in that routine is a way to sort of add that level of control back in our life. So getting up at five, even though you could sleep until six, um, you know, eating lunch at the same time, working until the same time, those kinds of things sort of can help us uh, reclaim the sense of control. So I want to touch just briefly on this, and then we're going to move into some of the external strategies uh, that we can. Hold on. Shelby? Michelle? Michelle? I tried. Um, so this pandemic dreams and pandemic dreaming is becoming a um, real, excuse me, just a minute. Okay, sorry about that. This is Shelby. I tell her, her her job is to detect threats and it's her brother's job, Thor, is to neutralize them. And so she takes her job very seriously. All right, easy. Um, pandemic dreaming is something that has uh, just been uh, given a name and a term just in the last few weeks. Today, there was a study that came out that 77% of us are experiencing the restless sleep, um, bizarre dreams, lucid dreams, nightmares. And there's a, there's a blog that I posted late last week on this notion of Jung's concept of the collective shadow and seeing this as an opportunity for growth. And it, so Jung always told us that our dreams or our unconscious or our shadow trying to communicate with us. And I think there's a unique opportunity to use this opportunity to explore that and what those may mean. And so we'll send that link out if you're interested. I won't go through it in the interest of time now, but I do talk about a nightmare that I had and what I was able to kind of glean from that and, and interpret it, if you will. And you can, anyone can interpret their own dreams. And when you do that, when, when the unconscious anxiety or fear passes into the consciousness, um, you, it loses control of it. And I can honestly say I have slept very well uh, since that uh, episode. So if, it's not just you. Um, this, this anxiety is showing up globally, 77% of the U.S. population at least, experiencing these dreams. And so again, there may be an invitation to understand what your shadow may be trying to communicate with you. Dreams are, are the only way that happens. So let me transition here just for the next few minutes and then we'll open it up for some Q&A um, for some external activities and for some things to think about. I'm all about reflection. I love the self-awareness piece, all about personal growth. Um, and that's all kind of interior work, internal development. But there's uh, also an opportunity here where we, I think we have to move. Physical activity um, and movement offers some tangible at, uh, concrete results. So we're dealing with a lot of ambiguity, we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty, but there are projects and other things that we can do that give us that immediate gratification and those kind of concrete, tangible results that I think um, we, we need now, uh, really desperately need is for a sense of being productive and a sense of satisfaction. And so I want to talk about these three activities as a way of, of sort of moving from the mental into the physical. And the first one really is about getting stuff done. Um, as I say there, you know, reading and writing is great, uh, but movement and physical activity are Im important, very important. And so now we have these opportunities to uh, walk every day, maybe in the morning or in the, or in the evening or afternoon or both, uh, home improvement projects that have been uh, begging for our attention, working outside in the yard. In my, in my case, it was cleaning out a garage and a basement. Uh, that needed to be straightened and cleaned. Um, we all have these projects around our house or outside where we, we can engage in, and that provides that immediate gratification. So now is the time, because again, this is fleeting. This, we will get on the other side of this, and it may be a missed opportunity if you don't take advantage of this time now to get your, literally get your house in order and think about some projects that you can engage in. Um, uh, and it might be that it's the, you know, writing uh, a book or writing the great American novel that you've been thinking about. So whatever that may be, there's an opportunity, I think, for that. Um, the second is participating in sort of what I call online affinity groups. Um, and I think there, there's sort of a, there's, there's an interest group and probably an app for just about every, 
every interest group, every everything you can imagine. So whether it's yoga or gardening or, in my case, military history, uh, whatever that may be for you, there's an opportunity to engage online in these communities. And you may find a connection that you wouldn't even have if you were physically close to someone that may not share your interest. And so uh, this is an opportunity to do a little research, find those groups, connect with these individuals, and explore whatever your passion is. Um, there are virtual happy hours like we're having right now. You can have those with your friends, your neighbors, your family, your coworkers and colleagues. Schedule that. Don't wait for someone else to do it. You be the one to reach out and organize that. You can do virtual workouts. Uh, you can have a gratitude challenge online. There are just a number of ways we can use this technology to help us connect with others. Um, and then finally, I think the opportunity exists to really to help others. Um, when, when I feel myself uh, you know, down about something or, or feeling sort of blue or depressed, um, I'm reminded of, of something that my parents taught me growing up, which was whenever you feel that, get up and help someone because there's someone in greater need than yourself. And so um, it felt like tough love at the time, but I've really come to appreciate that sort of mindset. Um, now is the time to, to really help others in the way that is sensible and safe where we can, because for many of us, this is uncertain and it's, it's you know, inconvenient, but there are others in our communities, that the elderly or the most vulnerable, that, are, that truly need our help now. And so putting together a care package for a neighbor and just leaving it on the door, um, donating your time, your talent, your treasure online to organizations that need it. Um, rescuing a pet uh, that can be like Shelby and be your detect, detect threats uh, are great ways to help you and also really make uh, the world a better place as well. So there's a number of opportunities that we can reach out and, and, and focus our attention on others um, and in doing so really help navigate through this time, feel better ourselves and also really make the world a better place. So as we move into the q and I just want to close on some final thoughts. We, again, we are living in unprecedented times, and I think it behooves us to say that, to make it explicit. Um, you know, Carl Jung was really big on when you have, when you declare something, you give it a, you know, you give it reality. Thinking something or keeping something to yourself, um, you don't give it that kind of declaration that, that needs to be said. So it's okay to say, these are unprecedented times. There's a lot of uncertainty and it's creating stress. Um, and, and being able to allow your family members, your loved ones, your spouse, significant others, your coworkers, maybe your direct reports at work, your colleagues, giving them the space and the compassion and empathy to express that as well. Um, this is the time I said earlier for self-care. So mental, emotional, physical, spiritual activities, all I think are more important now than ever. And so we have this opportunity to take that walk or um, engage in that project or write the great American novel, whatever that may be for you. And then finally, I would close with saying that if you do feel overwhelmed or you do feel depressed uh, and you're having a hard time shaking it, there's no shame in that. So don't have any shame, have, but reach out to a professional. Uh, reach out to someone who can, who can talk with you, who can listen to your concerns and who can help you with that. Um, these are, these are really unprecedented times, and I think that uh, a lot of us are experiencing that anxiety. And so if you have something that's really troubling you and you can't quite shake it, please uh, reach out to some, a professional and someone who can help you. So that's all I've got. We've got some time left for some Q&A, so I'm going to uh, advance this slide and I think turn it over to Jane and uh, see what kind of questions we have. Absolutely. Thank you, Will. Um, well, the first question is, um, this person's results came back as an affirmer. However, they resonate more strongly with the achiever style. How can they reconcile this? Okay, uh, well, that's a, that's a great question. It, it's not a very uncommon question. So I can tell you, um, without knowing the person, this is what I would speculate. Many affirmers um, are achievement driven because of the relationship. So if you, on the surface, if you look at the individual, they, they may be 
you know, uh, very driven in their career. They may be a great provider. They may be going back for the graduate degree. They may be, you know, what always improving themselves, always sort of driven to be successful um, and the like. But their driver, I would, I would hazard a guess with this person, their internal driver isn't for recognition like it is for a, a pure achiever. Their driver is for the relationship. And so oftentimes that individual, they're achieving, but they're doing so to either uh, find the right relationship or sustain the right relationship. Or so when they, if they peel that onion back, maybe one more uh, level, they'll, um, they likely will come to the realization that while these surface level behaviors seem to be more achievement driven, at the core, at the core, they are relationship driven. And so these uh, external outward behaviors are actually being done in the service to whatever relationship is paramount for them. All right, um, the second question, is there too much of trying to fill up the emphasis with learning a new skill, which can lead to more stress during this time? Well, I think that if you, if, if you're trying to learn something and it's causing you stress, um, I don't think it's learning and I don't think there's too much around learning a new skill, but it might be that whatever that is, um, is beyond your level of interest or maybe beyond your capability. And I would, I would put it down. I mean, if it's causing stress, then I would, um, I would find another opportunity for development or another skill. And so, you know, developing a skill or learn, learning a new skill in order to get in the zone the challenge of acquiring that uh, expertise has to just be beyond your capability. And if it's too far beyond, then it creates um, anxiety and stress. If it's too far below, it's just boredom. And so you want to try to find that right balance. And I'll give an example. I love music. Um, I, I'm a big, big music fan. Years and years ago, 25 years ago, I played the drums before I went off to school and I sold them and haven't really played that much since. Um, but I'm a great air guitar player. So I, anytime, you know, anything from Limelight by Rush to even Jesse's Girl by Rick Springfield and anything in between that comes on, um, if I've got a broom around me or if I've got my steering wheel in front of me, there will be some air guitar and air guitar solos. But I don't have the capability to play the guitar. I've, I've taken lessons throughout my life. I've picked it up a few times and I put it down because it's just been too frustrating. And so I've made peace with the fact that I don't have the, I don't have the capacity to learn the guitar. And maybe if I practice and practice and quit my job and just spent my entire life, maybe one day I could learn to play rhythm guitar for Take It Easy by the Eagles or something like that, but it's just not worth it. So I think if, you, if you're investing in a skill that's creating frustration, skill development is creating frustration, I would, I would look uh, for, the, for another instrument. All righty. Um, the next question is, what is the split around the US or the world of the three different profiles? Uh, <clears throat> that's a great question. So what we're, we, we do have this, the ALP, the full survey is translated into nine languages and we have done research across North and South America, Europe, and Asia. Um, and so we don't have a complete uh, comprehensive data set globally, but we have a thousand, tens of thousands of surveys in the database. And what we can say is that we find um, that roughly, uh, again, this is a rough estimate, the affirmer and the asserters account for about 40% and the achievers are about 30%, but that varies. Um, when you, uh, many attorneys have stronger achiever scores, engineers, uh, individuals in IT, they tend to be more detailed oriented and focused. And so depending on the subset you're looking at, you may see a, a vast majority of folks that are achievers, but roughly we, we tend to see just a little bit more in the affirmer and the asserter category um, with the achiever just at 30% compared to the 40% for the other two. Now, let me, let me say this. Um, when it comes to gender differences, uh, this is what we found. Uh, men are one and a half times more likely to be achievers than women. Um, women are one and a half more times likely to be affirmers. So men are one and a half more times likely to, to be achievers. Women are one and a half times times more likely to be affirmers. 
and men and women are equal on the need for power, which is the assertor style, and for self-actualization. So the self-actualization score is uh, constant across uh, genders, but we do see some gender differences with regard to achievement and affiliation. All right, terrific. One last question I think we have time for, and that is, what is everyone drinking today? <laughs> How are we? Oh, we got, oh, wait, okay. <laughs> uh, well, too early for me, has it? I, I'm assuming we've got uh, maybe a lot of folks out of the Eastern Standard Time Zone. So, uh, well, I've, I'm, I'm gonna disappoint. I, I have water, I have it in my McCall, School of Business, Tervis, but uh, I'll get started as soon as the webinar is, is over. So I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth. I just wanna thank everyone again for being here. Jane, thank you for your help. Tim Dixon, uh, who has been with us, is not on now, but he's behind the scenes. Tim's a wonderful colleague at Queens and he's been managing this for us. So Tim, thank you very much for all you've done to, to make this seem, at least for me, seamless because I know there's a lot of work that goes on behind that. So I appreciate that. And uh, as I said, we'll be following up with an email and I'll have some links to the blogs I referenced. I'll also have a link to a Harvard Business Review article that's been made available at no charge uh, dealing with grief during these times and also the Forbes article on being mindful and finding routine uh, in this time. So I, I found those articles to be very helpful and I'm happy to share those with you after this webinar today. So thank you. And Shelby. <laughs> thank you, Will. And it was great to see Shelby, um, the guard dog. Um, I know that there were some questions that we didn't get to. Um, you have the McCall School at queens.edu email if you want to follow up and have any other questions. Um, we'll do our best to get that answered. And we have recorded this session. And so when we share Will's resources, um, we will share, some, share this recording as well. Um, as we were going through this presentation, I started wondering if it was a problem that I'm seeing some shadows being triggered from leadership styles that aren't mine. Um, so I'm not sure what that really says about me in this quarantine mode. But um, again, I just want to thank everybody who is on here and has participated. Um, Will, if you could take us over to the last slide. Um, I wanted to let you know that our next Food for Thought will be on April 30th. We're going to do a working lunch edition. So it will start at noon and it will be with Casmer Ward. He's actually an MBA alum of our program, a serial entrepreneur, has a background as a CFO um, and in accounting. So he is going to talk to us about making value-based decisions in a pandemic and what large companies could learn from small business owners. So if you enjoyed this, we'll hope, we hope you'll tune back in and register for that event. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about the McCall School of Business, we have undergraduate programs um, for traditional undergraduate students and adults, um, graduate degree programs that include an MBA a and a Master of Science in Organization Development, which is all about change management. Dr. Sparks teaches in both of those programs and teaches our flagship course in leadership development. Um, and we also offer four graduate certificate programs, um, one in executive coaching, finance, healthcare management, leadership and change. And we are launching two new concentrations in the MBA program, which are also certificates this fall, which includes cybersecurity and global business management. Um, so if you're interested in learning any more about um, those programs, you can email school at queens.edu and we're happy to give you more information. Um, and finally, I wanted to mention our Executive Leadership Institute, um, which serves organizations across the region with leadership development programs, executive coaching, and advisory services. Um, I mentioned earlier that the McCall School of Business is about to celebrate its 40th anniversary. Um, and ELI is celebrating 30 years um, of a history that's rooted in developing competent principal leaders, um, the type of leaders that are needed now more than ever. Um, and they are available if you need, some, um, need somebody to come alongside you and be of service to you during this time or and once we get out of this time. So 
episode. Um, that's just a little bit about the McCall School of Business. And again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you will come back for our next Food for Thought and continue participating in this series. Have a great night.